Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Venturini, and if you're here with us, you are in for a treat for today's University of Rhode Island's Cooperative Extension Learn at Home webinar. We are going to be talking about um, animal science for youth with Christina DiCenzo, my friend and colleague who is the program coordinator for URI's 4-H program. Next slide. So Cooperative Extension at URI is um, a lesser known entity, but we do really important work and I love to always take the opportunity to tell people about what we do, which is mainly um, bringing science-based resources from the institution out to Rhode Islanders to help you all solve problems. And we do that around five, uh, what we call strategic areas of focus. And I think today's um, webinar kind of falls under a, a couple different ones here, um, healthy lifestyles, food systems and agriculture, and maybe a little bit of land stewardship. So. Um, we are very proud of what we do. Next slide. And um, we have been really happy to offer these webinars um, in light of our inability to be together in person. And so um, we just like to take the opportunity to say that we appreciate you spreading the word about this great science based information we're sharing through these webinars and when we're all back together again through our workshops and events. Um, it's really important to us that we can get this information out to everyone, um, especially those who can't come to the university themselves. So um, we are really committed, especially these days, to um, social justice and making sure that we're creating inclusive experiences that get science out into communities um, to inspire children, which is what we are going to do specifically today. So next slide, a few housekeeping items before I hand it over to Christina. One thing is that um, we will send an email message to you as soon as this webinar is over. And there's a link there to a survey um, that we would really love you for filling out. Um, the survey is one of the ways we determine how our educational programming is um, helping folks solve problems and if there's behaviors that you're doing differently as a result of gaining knowledge around science. So thank you in advance for completing that survey. And lastly, um, for those of you who are wondering um, how your friend or family member will um, be able to participate in this webinar if they're not able to be here now, we record all of these sessions and post them with closed captioning within a week onto our URI Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. We'll give you that link at the end of the presentation or you can just use a search engine to find it. Um, you'll click at Learn at Home and you can find this and about 25 other webinars we've offered since April there for your reference. So I hope you enjoy. I'm gonna hand it over to Christina and um, we will do questions and answers later on after Christina's slides, which you can just put right in the Q&A box at the bottom. Take it away, Christina. All right. Uh, my name is Christina, and as Kate said, I am a program coordinator for the University of Rhode Island 4-H program. So thank you so much for everyone who is here in person today. I'm so excited to be here and talking to you. Um, so before we really get into our animal science lecture, uh, I would like to just tell you a little bit more about what 4-H is. So 4-H is a part of Cooperative Extension, um, just like the Master Gardener program. And we are a youth development program. Uh, and we're actually sponsored by the United States Department of Agriculture, which is why when most people hear about 4-H, they they usually associate us with um, domesticated animals and farm animals because we have such strong agricultural history. But the four H's actually encompass more than just animals. They stand for head, heart, hands, and health because those are the qualities or the facets of our youth that we feel like we need to foster and nurture so that youth can grow up to be productive, contributing citizens. So, while we do work a lot with animals, and, and as you know, that's what we'll be talking about today, we also do a lot more at 4-H. 
Um, we explore other avenues of science and technology. We encourage leadership and life skills in our youth through public speaking, um, mentoring their peers, um, uh, engaging in community service events. And then we also promote healthy lifestyles and we encourage physical health, mental health, emotional health. We explore the arts through painting, drawing, and theater. Um, and then of course, we, we work a lot with our animals. So we raise animals, we show our animals at fairs and in contests, and we learn how to care for our animals. We learn a good deal about veterinary science. Um, so we've, we've got a lot going on at 4-H, but today I wanna talk to you specifically about animal science. So why animal science, right? Of, of everything that we could be talking about. So animal science relates to a lot of different scientific concepts. And this is really important that we teach our youth these scientific concepts because what um, survey data has told us is that fewer youth than ever are choosing to pursue careers in the sciences. And this is really unfortunate for a number of reasons, but um, most prominently because we have a lot of scientific issues in society today that are really pressing. Things like climate change and global warming, um, the rising pollution, and we need solutions to these problems and we need future generations to be able to contribute to finding solutions to these problems. So it's really critical that we teach our youth science as much as we can. Um, and it, it's also important that we engage youth in science when they're young, right? Because we know that when children are going through puberty, that's when they're starting to ask, well, who am I? What am I interested in? What am I gonna do when I grow older? Um, so it's especially important that we encourage people who might not usually be considered traditional scientists. So um, our young women, our children of color who receive so much messaging that science is not necessarily for them, right? We need to foster an interest in science. Um, so if you think too that science like really isn't for you, it's just not what you're interested in, um, I would encourage you to think about how much science you actually consume on a daily basis. Uh, there's been lots of research that show that most Americans are consuming science daily through um, pop culture, through television shows, um, through um, webinars like the one you're watching now, through literature, through podcasts. So for example, if you think of how many doctor shows or how many crime scene shows are on TV, so many people are watching those and they're actually getting scientific knowledge from those shows without sometimes even realizing that they are. So science is completely um, surrounding us in all aspects of our life. So even if we might think, you know, it's not, it's not our cup of tea, it's not for us, it's everywhere. So it's definitely worth learning about. And as Willie Nelson said, right, take your kids to a farm so they don't think that their food comes out of a box, right? Uh, animal science really encourages kids to think about how they get their food, um, to think about the connection between what they're eating and land use and management, which are more pressing scientific issues. Um, they encourage youth to think about sustainability, right? How can I, how can I get my food responsibly? Um, and these aren't really values that are pushed in mainstream society. So it's really critical that we take the initiative to explore these concepts with our kids. Here we go. So I wanna to talk to you today specifically about chickens, animal science related to poultry. Um, obviously, as you can imagine, there's lots of different directions you can go when talking about animal science. But poultry is a great introduction to animal science for a couple different reasons, right? Firstly, chickens are small. So if you want to study them in person, um, you, you don't need much space. Um, you can keep them in most backyards, which is great. So you can have them at your home and, and continually study them and learn about them. They're relatively inexpensive, which is not to say that it's cheap to own chickens because it's not but it's cheaper than owning things like cows or pigs or horses. Um, so again, great place to start with chickens. 
Uh, there's also fewer vet visits for chickens, so you're not going to rack up quite as many vet bills. Chickens don't need as many um, as many vaccines as other animals, um, so and and they don't have to go to the doctor quite as often, so they're a little bit easier to care for. They also produce eggs, right? Unlike other animals, so they produce. Uh, essentially ready to eat products. Obviously, there's a little bit of prep work involved, but um, it's a lot easier than um, harvesting products from other animals. And of course, chickens are pretty safe. Um, of course, they do have claws and beaks, so you have to be a little careful, but they're, they're very small and typically not very aggressive, right? So especially for young children, small children, it's a great animal to kind of kick off your, your study of animal science with. So that's why we'll be talking so much about them today. So if you want to keep chickens in your home, and especially if you want to hatch chickens in your home, right, you have to be mindful about where you're getting your eggs. So if you get eggs from a grocery store, for instance, right, those eggs are not going to be fertile. Uh, only infertile eggs are sold in the grocery store. And if you go into a farmhouse or a chicken coop and you pick up some eggs, those eggs actually aren't guaranteed to be fertile either. So chickens lay eggs um, constantly, regardless of whether they're fertilized or not. So they have to actually mate with a rooster to lay fertile eggs. So if you want to hatch eggs with your kids, right, you've got to make sure that they're fertile um, so that you don't spend uh, a couple of weeks just waiting around for chickens that aren't going to hatch. So once you've gotten some fertile eggs, the best place to start is at the very beginning uh, with the study of the egg itself, right? So the study of an unborn animal, or in this case, an unhatched animal, is called embryology. So embryology is another great animal science topic. And eggs are great because, as we'll see later, um, there's so much you can do to study eggs in real time, like as the eggs are developing, as the chicken is about to hatch. But before we get into that, right, we got to know some of the important parts of the egg. So most people know at least two parts of the egg just by eating them, right? We know that eggs have an egg white and an egg yellow, the yolk, right? But there's also a lot more going on inside the egg than you might think. So firstly, right, we have the yolk. We have that yellow part that we're familiar with. So has anyone ever gone to a restaurant, right? Think about it and seen like an egg white omelet on the menu or or something created with egg whites and it's it's great to eat because it's fewer calories. Well, actually the reason it's fewer calories to eat an egg white rather than an egg yolk is because the yolk is the part that contains all the proteins, all the nutrients that the, that the developing chicken is going to use to grow inside the egg. So that's why the yolk is really high in calories because it's so nutritious. Um, it has everything that the developing chicken needs to grow big and strong before it hatches. So we have the yolk and all around the yolk, uh, we have the egg white. And there's actually a special name for the egg white um, and it's called albumin, right? So the albumin, before you cook it, and it you know turns into egg whites, it's actually a liquid inside the egg. Um, and what it does is it provides lots of cushioning for the egg. So the yolk isn't just rocking around inside the egg, banging up against the shell. It's kind of cushioned and supported um, and suspended, right, in a liquid so that it stays nice and safe. And eggs actually have a second mechanism for keeping the yolk and the developing embryo safe. And that is something called a chalaza, right? So what a chalaza is, is this spirally little membrane that you see on the screen. So there's two of them. And when it's plural, they're called chalazi. And they're little membranes that grab the yolk on one end and grab the shell on the other end. So what they do is they're like little anchors, keeping the yolk firmly in place in the center of the egg. So that it doesn't rock around, doesn't get injured once the chicken starts growing inside it. 
So also, if you ever hard boiled an egg and peeled the shell off and gotten your egg free, then you might be familiar with another feature of an egg, uh, which is its multiple membranes. So between the shell, between the shell, right, and the albumin and the yolk, there's um, two membranes. And the membranes actually serve to keep the developing chicken healthy. So the shell, right, the outside of the egg, even though it looks really solid and really hard, it is actually um, completely covered with pores that allow air into the egg. So as you might imagine, when you allow air in, you can also allow a lot of other things in that are unwanted. Um, so namely, we're talking about bacteria, right? If air can get in somewhere, bacteria can also get in. So what the membranes of the egg do is they filter out the bacteria and any other harmful substance that might have been let in by the pores, right? So that it doesn't reach the yolk and the developing embryo. Okay, so an egg looks really simple, but there's actually a lot going on inside and more things than, than we'll talk about today. Now, that that anatomy of an egg, that figure that we studied, it doesn't look like that the whole time that the egg is developing. Certain parts get smaller, certain parts get larger, all to accommodate the developing chicken. So I have a video here. Um, I'm not going to play it because it comes across really choppy, um, but we can see in this video um, how a chicken develops inside the egg. It's really cool. It's a real time animation. So as um, the chicken gets bigger, right, the yolk gets smaller. And if you think about that, right, why would that be? It's because the chicken is actually absorbing all of those nutrients from the yolk. And of course, the egg only has a certain amount of room to store all of its parts. So as the chicken gets bigger, um, the albumin or the egg white and the yolk gets smaller. And this is actually the reason that if you hatch chicks, you don't need to feed them for the first two or three days after they've hatched because they're so full of, no, of nutrients from absorbing the yolk that they don't need food for a little bit. That's how nutritious um, the, the yolk is for the developing embryo. So once this uh, developing chicken has grown and it's ready to start um, pecking its way out of the egg, um, you'll be at about 21 days, right? It takes only 21 days for um, a chicken to fully develop and be ready to emerge. But over the course of those 21 days, you can see different stages of development, not just through an animation, but you can actually see it in real time, in real life, um, by doing something called candling. So if you're not familiar with candling, all it really is, is taking an egg and holding it very gently up to a light source, um, and you can illuminate the developing embryo inside the egg. So on the screen here, we have a couple of pictures of eggs being candled at different stages of development. So you can see that um, over the course of the 21 days, this diagram goes up to 28 days, um, the developing embryo in the center is growing larger. It's developing a system of blood vessels um, so that it can feed itself. Um, and essentially, you'll see that the egg gets darker and darker, right, as you go along. And that is one of the ways you can tell that your egg is indeed fertile and is indeed developing, because you'll see that embryo get really big and start to take up the entirety of the egg. So this, to me, is absolutely crazy, that you can seriously watch an animal develop inside an egg um, by shining a light source. Um, up, which is wild. So you can actually do this too with lots of other different types of eggs. So lots of times at aquariums, they will have shark eggs available for candling. So you can actually see a shark embryo develop. And of course, it develops and looks different than this chicken um, embryo. So once you learn about candling, you can apply it to lots of different types of animals, which is really awesome. Now I have another video, um, you'll be able to see it if you um, check back on this webinar once it's been posted online. But uh, the, the images that you saw before, right, are, are really quality images of an egg being candled. And if you, you try it yourself, right, you may not get images that look as crystal clear as that. So this video shows what um, 
kind of what the average person right might see when they candle an egg at home. And even on this um, freezed point in the video, you can see some blood vessels right spreading across um, the egg and you can see where the embryo is where it's nice and dark. And so you would know just from looking at this right if I go back to the previous screen, you would know about how many days the chicken inside this egg has been developing. And so you also know when it might hatch. So you can really, especially if you're, you're um, doing this activity with kids, you can really map out exactly how long it's gonna take, exactly where you are in the process, exactly when you'll finish, which is really great and really helpful um, for us as teachers. So to do this, to develop an embryo, nice and beautifully, as we've seen in pictures, there are a couple tricks. Um, so you'll want to put your eggs in something called an incubator. And the incubator has a couple features that um, allow the eggs to develop properly. So the first thing it has is an egg turner. So if you, to me, this looks like a big um, connect four block, but what you do is you actually put the eggs in each of those little circles and the egg turner will gradually shift back and forth like this. And so what that does is it prevents the yolk from sticking to one side of the egg. Even though the yolk has support systems like the chalaza, like the albumin, you know, sometimes accidents happen, um, malfunctions occur, and the yolk can end up in a place it's not supposed to be, right? So if the yolk does get stuck to one of the sides of the, of the egg, um, it can develop improperly or it can halt development altogether. So it's really important that we gently rock our yolk um, to lower the chances of it sticking to one side or the other. So another feature of the incubator is that where uh, we can control the heat and the humidity um, of the or surrounding the eggs. So the incubator features a thermometer and a hygrometer. And a hygrometer is a device used for measuring humidity. So eggs do have an optimal temperature and humidity level for developing. So you want your eggs um, to be at about 40 to 50% humidity. Right, and you want the temperature to be about 100 degrees, which seems very, very warm, right? But imagine um, for developing humans, right, how hot it is inside the mother's body. Um, so, so this is actually the optimal temperature for raising up eggs. Um, now, even though you might set your thermometer and your hygrometer to the desired temperature and humidity, you'll notice that the numbers fluctuate quite a lot. And there's some important reasons for that that you may or may not um, be thinking about. So firstly, if you happen to put your incubator near a vent or a window or even a doorway that's um, where the door is open and closed frequently, little tiny alterations in the temperature will occur. And even though your incubator is closed, right, it'll alter the temperature and humidity inside the incubator too. And this will also happen um, if you open and close your incubator a lot because you're really excited and you want to look at your eggs, you want to candle them. You have to remember that every time you open the incubator, you're changing the conditions inside of it, right? So you have to be really diligent about um, keeping your eggs in the optimal condition. So again, after 21 days, you'll see this little guy pop out. Baby chicks are the cutest thing. I've never met um, a child who wasn't super thrilled to see a baby chick fresh out of the egg. Here's another video. Again, you'll be able to see it later of what it looks like when um, a chicken hatches in real time. So if you don't want to or can't hatch chickens in your home or in your school, uh, lots of different organizations such as 4-H and zoos and aquariums offer live stream hatchings that you can tune into. So you can see a video recording of this happening in real time and you can watch it from a nice comfortable distance, right? Rather than have to be responsible for the eggs yourself if you want to. Um, so this little guy, if you can see him on the screen, he's totally hatched right out of the egg. And when chicks come out, it's important to remember if we never hatched chicks before, they look a little bit slimy and, and not quite like the fluffy little baby chickens that we often see in pictures. 
And so for that reason, right, we want to keep our chicks in the incubator um, until they have um, dried out completely and become nice and fluffy and warm. So this is often a time too when things can get a little uncomfortable with our kids, right? Because the reality is as careful as we are during the incubation process and as careful as we are in selecting quality fertile eggs, not all of them develop, right? Um, we can't always mimic the conditions that occur in the wild or that occur in a chicken coop. And, you know, even if we could in the coop, not 100% of the eggs hatch all the time. And um, this can lead to some uncomfortable questions with our kids, right? Who may be wondering why or um, why a chicken didn't hatch all the way or why a chicken hatched, but it looked a little bit weird or why a chicken hatched asleep, right? So we wanna make sure that as teachers and as educators, uh, we have some answers ready for this, right? Because the, the likelihood is that we won't get 100% hatching. So we've got to have some explanations on hand for, for why that is um, and a gentle way to explain what we might see in the incubator. So once the baby chicks hatch, right, it's a whole different story. Um, we need a lot of different resources to care for our baby chicks. So firstly, right, we need space and we need different types of space too. So chickens have to have a space to nest, right? If you want them to lay eggs, they need a space to create a nest. They also need a space to roost, right? And roosting chickens um, are perching chickens. They perch up high where they might sleep. And generally they like to sleep in places that they don't want to nest. So we need to accommodate those different spaces. Chickens also need some exercise, right? They need to get out of the coop. They need to walk around. Um, they need to be fit. So we have to have that room for them as well. So secondly, right, we need shelter for our chickens. And we need shelter for a couple of different things. We need to protect them from the elements. If our chickens are outside all year round, they'll get very hot and they'll get very cold. Um, so we have to protect them from both of those extreme temperatures. We also need to protect them from predators and pests. Um, so we have to make sure our chickens are very securely um, cooped up in our backyard or wherever we're keeping them. So we also need food for our chickens, of course. So some people, right, have you ever heard of um, free range chickens? Free range chickens are supposed to be super healthy and super natural um, because they walk around across a big pasture and they forage for their food, just like wild chickens would. So they peck um, in the grass, they eat some plant matter, they eat some insects, and that's their diet. A lot of people may not have the space to allow chickens to, to be free range. And so if you don't, you're gonna wanna buy your chickens um, special chicken feed. And chicken feed is very nutritious. It includes all of the proteins and vitamins that chickens need to be nice and healthy. So either way, you decide to raise your chickens, right? You need to know what food is best for them. We also need water for our chickens, right? And not much to say about that. We wanna make sure our chickens always have access to fresh water. We need to make sure our chickens have access to clean air. Uh, we might not always think about this, but chickens poop a lot, right? And when they poop, their poop emits a gas that can be harmful to the chickens if, if it's not let out into the air, right? So we want our chickens to be healthy. We want those gases to escape out of the coop. We have to make sure we have windows or vents um, or doorways so that our chickens can um, stay healthy and breathe clean air. Our chickens also need light. Um, so this is especially important if you have laying hens, right? Chickens that are going to produce eggs. So light actually um, is one of the main things that stimulates hens to lay eggs. And hens, hens need a good 12 to 16 hours a day of light. So what this means is that if you want your hens to be laying eggs year round, right? In the winter time, you may have to provide an alternative light source. 
So you might have to go out and rig up your coop um, with electricity so that you can turn on the light bulbs and stimulate your chickens to do some egg laying. And then finally, of course, right, we always have to consider price um, because even though it might not cost very much to hatch chickens, right, we have to um, be able to afford space for them, afford shelter, afford food and air and light structures that provide those resources. Um, so it's always a great idea before you purchase a chicken to have you and your child or um, your student sit down together and develop a chicken budget. How much will it take um, to care for a certain amount of chickens per year or per month or however long you plan on keeping them so that there are no surprises um, when your chicken, um, you know, needs more room because it's grown up, um, when your chicken lays eggs and some of them hatch because they're fertile maybe and all of a sudden you have more chickens than you bargained for. It's always a great idea to create a plan for how you're going to raise your chickens and exactly how much that's going to cost you. Now this on the screen is a model chicken coop. This is a really awesome chicken coop for a number of reasons. Um, it provides access to all of the resources that we just talked about. So this chicken coop is elevated, right? It has space underneath it for the chickens to walk around. It also has a door that opens up so the chickens could come out and roam around the yard. Um, we assume that inside, right, it has an area for the chickens to nest and up high because it looks to be maybe a two stories tall, it'll have a place for the chickens to roost. So it's accommodating all of their spatial needs. Um, this chicken coop also has a very cute little window in it and a door so that the chickens get fresh air, they get uh, light all year round. Um, and if you notice, it's screened in um, completely, right? There's mesh along the sides, along the top, and there should even be mesh on the bottom, right? Not inside the coop, but when you um, dig down, right, you wanna make sure that that mesh actually goes into the ground and flips out like that. And the reason for it is that predators, when they're trying to get in because they want the chickens and they want the eggs, they're gonna dig down into the dirt. And they're gonna try to dig right up into the coop. But if we have mesh that goes down into the dirt, if the animals, if the predators dig down far enough, they're just going to hit more mesh and they're not going to be able to get in. Um, or they're going to give up before they figure out another way to get in. So this is a great chicken coop. So a really important aspect of raising chickens, right, is understanding the importance of doing so. So you may have heard of a movement um, called farm to table. And what does farm to table mean? Well, it essentially means that um, you want to be able to trace your food back to its origins and that you want your food to be locally sourced, right? Because if your food is local, it's much easier to trace back the origins of it. So this brings us back to that Willie Nelson quote that we saw earlier in the presentation. Right? We want our kids to know where our food is coming from, how it got from the farm to their table, right? So if anyone ever actually has watched the show Portlandia, there's a really funny skit where two people go out to a restaurant and they quiz their waiter about where their chicken came from, what its name was, um, did it have friends, did it did it have a best friend? Was its name Kyle? And it's it's ridiculous. But the essential message, right, is that we want to um, ensure that our food came from a good place. So why is this important, right? Why is it important that our food came from a good place? Um, so the farm to table movement offers a couple really great benefits, right? So firstly, it reduces harmful emissions because when we don't grow our food locally, right, when it's shipped across the country, we need fuel for planes and trains and buses that are transporting our food where it needs to go. And of course, we have extremely high um, food needs. So there's lots of trains, lots of planes going across and back across the country. So if we can grow our food locally, 
and bring it maybe to a farmer's market and sell it there, right? We really cut down on the emissions that we need to transport. Another great benefit of farm to table is that it reduces the need for harmful pesticides and herbicides, uh, anything else you might use to maintain um, gardens or commercial farms. So when we grow our food locally, we tend to grow our food in small little plots, right? Because most of us can, can keep chickens maybe, can keep a couple pigs, can keep a garden, but we can't have acres and acres of land that we're tending to, right? But when we do have acres and acres of land, like those commercial farms do, they use um, a extremely high amount of chemicals to help maintain that land, right? But when we have small plots of land, we don't need as much to maintain it. Another great benefit is that farm to table reduces animal cruelty. So when we uh, care for our animals, we tend to think of them as, well, some of us do, right? Think of them as pets. They're part of the family. They're part of the landscape. We care for them as best we can. Um, whether or not we end up bringing them to market, we care for them. Um, mostly, right, because we have the space and the resources to do so. But, of course, when animals are raised on commercial farms, right, they're not typically viewed as pets. Um, or even animals, right? They're viewed as products. So sometimes they don't have all those resources that we talked about before, right? They don't have adequate space. They don't have adequate um, access to fresh air. They don't have clean drinking water. So by um, supporting farm to table, right? We're also ensuring that we treat our animals a little bit better. Another great benefit, right? Is that buying locally, supports our local economies, right? So we're putting money right back into our economy, which is fantastic. And we're supporting our local farmers and our local vegetable growers. Uh, food harvested, right, from local farms also tends to be fresher. And I'm talking here um, in terms of vegetables and fruits as well. So vegetables and fruits are usually harvested at peak ripeness when they're grown locally. Um, and then they're brought to the farmer's market, maybe within the week, within a couple of days, and they get to your table. So you're getting really ripe food, um, and ripe food usually has lots of nutrients in it, right? But when food is shipped across the country, it tends to get past the point of being ripe. It's overripe and it starts to lose its nutrients. And then finally, right, by engaging in local farming, um, and especially in vegetable and fruit growing through community gardens um, and other community um, activities, we engage our kids, right, in a sense of community. We're introducing them to the concepts of working together, um, collaborating, and to contributing to something that's bigger than any single kid, right? Which is, of course, um, a great lesson and, and something that we really prioritize in 4-H. So what's the best way to practice what we preach and eat farm to table? Well, one of the easiest ways to do so is to go to your local farmer's market. Um, in Rhode Island, there are farmer's markets all over the state, especially in uh, the southern part of the state and in Providence. I'm sure Kate can tell you a lot more about that than I can. Um, so if you can't make it to your farmer's market, Right, you can try to go to restaurants that say that they source their food locally. The trick is some restaurants say that and they don't necessarily mean it. So sometimes you have to do a little research to find those places that do buy from local farmers and, and local growers. And um, even though you're not buying the food directly from the people who grow it, right? if you go to one of those restaurants, you're still um, stimulating um, the local economy, you're still supporting your local farmers. Or, as we've learned today, you can do it yourself at home, right? There are a lot of ways you can contribute to the farm to table movement, even if you don't want to keep chickens. Um, if you live in an urban area, you can engage in rooftop gardening. Um, you can grow your own herbs and vegetables that you use for cooking. Um, Excuse me. So there's lots of ways that you can get involved. And in by doing so, right, 
you are creating a healthier diet for yourself, for your kids, and you're teaching a really valuable lesson about where your food comes from and why it's important that you know that in the first place. So if you want a little extra help, right, you can also check out resources from 4-H. Uh, we have lots of different kits um, with hands-on activities and materials that you can loan out and borrow that teach you exactly how to engage in farm-to-table movements, how to grow your own vegetables, how to care for animals. Uh, we actually have our own embryology kit that we lend out regularly that contains an incubator and chick feed and all the other resources that you need to hatch eggs. And then um, we will help you find a place to give your chickens away if you don't want them once you've hatched them. So there are lots of resources around, right, if you really want to dig further into this topic. So I hope that you will consider doing so um, and have learned or maybe uh, increased your fondness of chickens today. Um, so if you want to get in touch to learn more, um, please don't be shy. Visit our website and our Facebook page. We're on social media. Um, and please never um, hesitate to send me an email. I'm always happy to share resources or answer any questions that you may have. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. And I'm going to turn it back to Kate. That was awesome. I'm going to go get chickens. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Can you, so I'll, maybe we can leave, leave the um, 4-H social media stuff up on the screen for a moment. There are a couple slides after this, I think, but we, you did have a question about um, going back to the yolk. Mm. Talk what the red spot is on the yolk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So I believe uh, it was labeled as the germinal disc on the diagram, which is a very jargony term. Um, but essentially, the red spot is the embryo. If you if the egg was um, fertilized, right? the embryo is going to start out as that tiny red spot, and then it's going to develop into the chicken. I did see too that if there's a red spot on the yolk in, in an egg that you get from the store, that kind of, it could be blood vessel or where the membrane separated from the hen. If you're <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So I apologize, let me just, turn off that for a second. Um, but yeah, so when chickens lay eggs, right, they don't know, of course, whether or not they're going to be fertilized. So they put all of those resources into developing uh, really, really high quality eggs. So um, even if they're not fertilized and they're not going to produce an embryo, they still have all the structures needed to do so. Very cool. Does anyone else have any other questions for Christina? I'm going to ask one, but we'll wait. We'll wait to see if anyone has any other questions. Um, is there, um, if you're if you're buying chicks, so if you're kind of fast forwarding and you're not going to rear right. them, are there better places to get them? over others. I know we don't necessarily recommend businesses specifically, but is there any um, responsible consumer behavior around where you purchase chicks? Yeah, and and unfortunately, there's not um, an easy answer to that so much is that you really have to go and check out the facility, if, especially if it's somewhere local. Um, so for instance, hens, if they're not being fed quality diets, will not produce high quality eggs. And so those eggs may not develop, or if they do develop, they might not develop into very healthy chicks. Um, mm. So if you're purchasing eggs, you wanna make sure that the parents are really well cared for because how well cared for they are will directly influence the health of the chicks. But you know, there's really no way you're gonna, unless you're going to take someone's word for it, you have to go and, and see for yourself. Okay, I lied. I have another question. <laughs> um, so we're not having an in-person Washington County Fair, and I know that's where um, 
you know, there's a lot of 4-H involvement in, in that fair and then the Big E and other kind of larger come togethers. Are you, how are, how's 4-H keeping kids involved and how can folks who may be watching this or listening to this get their own kids involved in 4-H? Kind of double prong question. Thank you, that's a wonderful question. So it's been tough um, because our bread and butter is hands-on activities, right? And, and that's what kids we find respond to most. Um, but we have, out of necessity, been going completely digital. So we have been trying to translate all of our traditional in-person activities to online events. So for example, we, since Washington County is canceled and, and our local fairs were canceled earlier this summer, uh, we just held our first completely virtual state fair where um, kids worked with their animals and filmed it or took pictures um, and they had different, you know, qualifications or guidelines that they had to follow to demonstrate um, that they could handle their animal, um, that they could um, demonstrate the healthy qualities of their animals. And they submitted, you know, digital proof and we were able to share what they submitted in a community forum so that other 4-Hers um, could see it and could comment um, and get feedback. So we actually just wrapped that up uh, last night which was great. It was up for about a month, but, but beyond our fairs, right? We, um, we've been doing uh, a lot of activities that you can um, do at home. We'll offer training videos and we'll provide you resources if you request them. So you can learn how to do it from us digitally and then go home and try it yourself. And then of course we have um, webinars like we're doing right now uh, where we're interactive and we can see everyone's faces and um, we'll do um, educational activities all together, but remotely. Awesome, we have a bunch of, a bunch of questions here. I think we have, a, yeah, we have, okay, so um, we have, do you throw away the egg if it has the red spot when you go to cook it? Good question. No, you do not need to do that. You can totally cook it and it will be completely fine. Um, beyond eggs, lots of different cuts of meat tend to have some remaining blood vessels or other structures. And as long as you cook it up thoroughly, it is completely fine to eat. Awesome. How long do chickens typically live? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> question. Well, apparently Kate can tell us um, nine years. <laughs> But nine years is, is long for chickens. Um, there's a range. Uh, most chickens that, that I've experienced have lived about five years, um, five to maybe six or seven. Mm. Okay. Um, I think we have a question from Susan, maybe with a young person who would like to know what predators will eat chickens. That's a great question. So lots of things like to get into the chicken coop. Um, some predators want to get to the chickens and some predators want to get to the eggs. Um, so think of things like raccoons, coyotes, fisher cats, um, snakes like to eat eggs sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything. Most things in the wild will want to get to your eggs and your chickens. Fox. Yes, Fox. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then I think our last question is how effective is it to get fertile eggs and let your hens hatch and raise them? Um, will they do it or take to it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will say that in my personal experience, I don't know of anyone who who has done that typically if you want to hatch your own eggs um you you have one rooster in the flock right um and and you allow your chickens to mate and hatch their own eggs um lots of times and this is not just chickens but across species if um you try to introduce a foreign child or offspring right the animal doesn't take to it the way that it would if it produced it itself um 
for chickens especially, it would be like slipping like a rock <laughs> underneath, you know, in their little nest. So, um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I know more about the science of chickens than I do actually raising chickens. Um, so I, I don't think it's as effective, but to be honest, I'm not entirely sure if it would work. So it's a great question. I'll have to go look it up. Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of like the more you can leave nature to do the work, you know, and I think that's true of in any application, Absolutely. Um, the better. But I think this has been really enlightening, Christina. This was a great um, session, and I hope that um, folks are inspired to think more about um, you know, getting getting chickens or or other wild wild well, should I say wildlife farm animals, <laughs> um, and and working you know using the animals almost to work with kids to, in their own leadership development. Um, Lily Lily has another question. Um, sure. I'd like to know what the best material is to put in the nest box. Is it hay or straw or or shavings of some kind? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is you can pretty much use whatever you want as long as your chicken is comfy. So um, most people right, tend to use hay and straw because if you have farm animals, that's what you have readily available to you. Um, but chickens, when they were wild, had to make their nest out of grass and twigs. So you could um, use that too. And then um, they will they'll sometimes gather their own materials to put into the nest to make it more comfy. So they might gather extra pieces of straw that they find around or feathers um, to make it really soft. But as long as you're using something natural and something soft, you can't go wrong with what you're putting in the nest. Awesome. So Jamie, Jamie, thank you so much for all of your questions and comments. Um, they said for parents wanting their kids in 4-H, my son is five, do we need to have animals? They have chickens, but that's it. And where where can we sign up? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> so you do not need animals. Um, I personally do not own any animals and I don't intend to. I've been told that once you join 4-H, you know, the animal fever gets to you, but you certainly <laughs> do not need to own them. And you don't even need to study animals really in 4-H. Um, we do a lot of activities in, um, other branches of science like biology and chemistry. Um, we we study wildlife, we we have art programs. So whatever interests you have, um, you can choose to pursue that. So so if you don't have animals there, but you like them, there are so many people in 4-H who are always thrilled to share their knowledge and their resources with you. That's great. So where can where can parents sign their kids up? Yeah, thank you for reminding me. So if you uh, if you visit that website on the screen, uri.edu slash 4-H, there will be um, a tab called join or, or get involved. I can't remember what we've called it lately, um, but just click there and you'll be able to create an online profile and sign right up. I will say too, it is um, $10 a year to join 4-H, but that $10 a year gives you access to all of our events and activities. Um, so I'm very happy that you're considering it. That's great. Jamie said they're a wildlife biology major turned culinary instructor. Oh, Love all of this and 4-H is amazing. And I agree. <laughs> and I think, you know, those of you watching and listening, you know, 4-H probably has one of the higher profiles out of all of Cooperative Extension's programs nationally. And I think in Rhode Island, you know, we're not a big ag state, but we do have youth and we do have <laughs> scientific knowledge and we do have a need to develop youth into critical thinkers and 4-H I find as an observer um, has a lot of great resources about how to break down some of the science um, and get kids jazzed about it, whether like Christina has been talking about it's chickens and other animal science topics or just general leadership and responsibility. And um, so I really encourage all of you to, to dial in a little bit more and um, check out some of these resources. Christina, could you go two slides ahead? If you Absolutely, yeah. I just wanna I, I, share, I, I, yeah. Sure, 
And I will just say quickly too, for, for anyone who's interested, I came to 4-H having no experience with farm animals. Um, I studied wildlife, so which is very different, but just by being around other 4-H members, you learn so much through mm. osmosis. So um, you'll learn, you know, <laughs> even if you think that you won't. So let me go ahead. I think that's a testament too, to how enthusiastic people are about <laughs> who are involved in 4-H. I mean, we find that in, in gardening and in energy, you know, there's just, there's a real passion for it. And it's a lot easier to learn from people who are passionate. So can't say enough about you all doing this great work. And I think um, just as a, a companion to some of the resources we shared, these are very Rhode Island centric resources. But for any of you who are joining us from other states, I want to mention that there are cooperative extension offices in every state in the United States. Um, and, you know, if you need to find locally relevant resources, they will be there for you. Just do a little poking around online here in Rhode Island. Um, we have lots of different programs within cooperative extension. And if you have gardening and environmental questions that you'd like to get a local answer to, you can actually send those questions in an email to gardener at uri.edu and a real live person will write back to you within three days, which I've been working here for 15 years. I still think that's amazing. Um, and then this Learn at Home webinar series is offered um, into the fall, probably Tuesdays at seven. You can also always send us a general question about any um, environmental or gardening or animal husbandry or um, really any topic and um, we will get an answer to you. So um, I think with that, we will bid everyone adieu. Thanks so much for those of you who are here today and um, for those of you watching online, thanks for taking part in this extension webinar. Thank you, Christina. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day.